see you this morning. I have a feeling some people might have forgot to turn their clocks ahead, but I'm glad to see you here and you remembered and you came in spite of the fact that it may be snowing by the time we leave, so welcome. And I want to especially welcome the Girl Scouts who are here too this morning. Yay! <laughs> um, announcements are found on the back of your bulletin and on the screen. Uh, tomorrow morning at 10, the Dress a Girl Sewing Group will be meeting. And on Wednesday, uh, I will be leaving for Indiana on a vacation to be with my aunt and uncle who are celebrating their 70th wedding anniversary. They're both still living in their own home and they're 90 and 96 years old. So I'm, it'll be a great celebration. Um, on Thursday, the Lenten study, Eileen will be leading it on, on Thursday this week. And uh, next Sunday, Gail, Gary will be preaching. I thought she, she and Brian might be here today to see how it goes, but maybe they are the ones who forgot. I don't know. And the other announcements about the supper last night. Okay, yeah. Now, last night was the starting of the second half of the suppers. So I want to thank everybody that helped out. We took in $1,373. The cost was 44089. We made a profit of 932. All right, good profit. So the day is the first Sunday in Lent, and we will begin by singing Lord who throughout these 40 days, number 269, and on the screen.
What are these? The Ten Commandments, right. And I know that Eileen talked to you about them last week, about things that we are supposed to be doing because God wants us to do these things. And notice the first four are about our relationship with God and the Sabbath, and the last six have to do with how we treat each other. And they are things like honor your father and mother, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, that means lie, and thou shalt not covet, that means want something else that someone else has. So, I have in here a cup of M&Ms in little packages. I want to know if someone would be willing to have these in, in return for what? What would you do for these candies? What would you be willing to do for these candies? Would you be tempted to do something bad? For instance, if I said, you can have this whole cup of M&Ms if you play a trick on someone, like spray silly string in their faces, or teepee their house, you know what that means? Teepee their house, I mean, throw toilet paper on their trees and stuff. Would you be willing to do something bad to get these? No? You guys are good good people. <laughs> what if I said, um, put a whoopee cushion on someone's chair? Would you do that for these? Are you sure? What if I promised you two cups of these things? Or a whole bag of them? Would you do it then? What's your price? Could you be tempted and all? Oh. I'm in. Anybody? <laughs> we got people tempted back there. <laughs> well, today, on the first Sunday of Lent, we often talk about Jesus being tempted. And Jesus was tempted to have something that he really wanted. He wanted bread. And so the, the devil told him he could have this bread if it were all down and worshiping. And um, he was tempted by all kinds of things. You know, he, could, he was tempted to uh, uh, be the, to, well, basically to worship the devil. And what did Jesus tell the devil to do, do you think? Just like you kids, he says, no way. I'm not going to do it. Take a hike. Go away. And he, he resisted the temptation. And when the devil saw that he couldn't tempt Jesus, he left. So Jesus was tempted, and maybe some of you were tempted for this candy, but you resisted the temptation. Jesus knew that temptation was hard. Sometimes when we get in trouble, it's, tempting to lie, right? I didn't do it, she did it, right? Or things like that. So in the Lord's Prayer, there is a word, a sentence that's very important. You know what that was? It has to do with temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Remember the line in the Lord's Prayer? 
Deliver us from evil. So whenever you're tempted to do something that you think might be wrong, like to lie to your parents or to steal something in the grocery store when you think the clerk isn't looking or to cheat on your exam, resist the temptation. Okay, just pray to God to help you resist that temptation. So let's, uh, let's be in prayer and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Dear God, there are so many temptations around us. Lead us not into temptation, Lord. But if we should be tempted, please help us to know how to say no to the temptation. We pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for us. Amen. All right, now everybody can have some candy. But don't eat it unless your parents say it.
morning is from the book of Exodus, chapter 32, verses 1 to 24. I'll, I'm going to introduce this by saying that Moses has gone up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. They had already agreed to them, and he's gone up there to get them. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come! Make gods for us who shall go before us, as this Moses, this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once, your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf, and have worshipped it, and sacrificed it to, to it, and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, and how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring upon the people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain, carrying the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, written on the front and on the back. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, engraved upon the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the sound made by victors or the sound made by losers. It is the sound of revelers that I hear. As soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger grew hot and he threw the tablets from his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made, burned it with fire, ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn hot, you know the people, that they are bent on evil. They said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, Whoever has gold, take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Quite a story. Let us pray. 
O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever made a promise and then gone back on your word? I bet you have. And I'm not speaking about the minor disagreements that we make to one or the minor agreements that we make to one another every day, like, I promise I'll call you, or I promise I'll take out the garbage on Friday morning or whenever the price comes. We make all these little promises and sometimes we forget or we break them. But if we do break them, we usually mend fences or try to. But there are other agreements that have significant and far-reaching consequences for our lives. There are some promises that, if we break them, turn our world upside down. Consider the following example, which is all too familiar for many of us. Mike and Helen were a couple very much in love. They dated for more than two years and then decided to get married. Following months of planning and preparation, Mike and Helen stood in front of their pastor and hundreds of family and friends on a Saturday afternoon, and they made promises to each other. A kiss sealed their agreement. The applause of their witnesses affirmed it, and they lived happily ever after for about a year. On their first anniversary, Mike discovered that Helen had been unfaithful. The details are not important except to know that Helen did not keep her end of the agreement. Now, Mike was standing before his wife, holding in his hands the covenant they had signed on their wedding day. He began to read it out loud. Question, will you love him, comfort him, honor and keep him? Answer, I will. Question, will you care for him, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health? Answer, I will. Question, will you be faithful to him as long as you both shall live? Answer, I will. With that, Mike tore their wedding covenant into tiny pieces and threw them into the air, and they never spoke again except through their attorneys. Not ever. You see, when a covenant is broken, it is not easily repaired. When a promise is made, it is like a gleaming crystal vase. But when a promise is broken, the pieces lie shattered on the floor. The story of God's covenant with you and me goes back more than 4,000 years, when a leader named Moses was called to a high mountain to meet with God face to face. Moses was already a hero, having been used by God to bring people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt to a land of their own. And now God was offering these same people a promise, a relationship so special, the people of Israel could only be called chosen. These are the words that God used. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my special treasure among all peoples. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. When Moses brought God's offer to them, the people were ecstatic. They immediately agreed to obey God's commands. We will do it, they shouted. Everything the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses went back up to the mountain and sealed the deal. It was not a kiss between lovers. It wasn't the applause of angels. It was contract time, and God's expectations would be written in stone. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Written in stone. We use that expression, even in these times, to describe something that is sure and long-lasting. In fact, when I was looking for this PowerPoint slide, I saw a lot of things, though. It said, nothing is written in stone. So I wonder. But anyway, when something is written in stone, it's meant to be permanent. And that is exactly what God intended the Ten Commandments to be, a covenant that would last forever. With his own hands, God cut the tablets. With his own fingers, God engraved the words. 
God's love for his people was written in stone. But the problem was Moses was gone a long time, over a month, 40 days and 40 nights. The people of Israel who waited impatiently finally began to get restless. They figured Moses wasn't coming back. So they talked Aaron into helping them make gods. And Aaron cooperated fully with the people. Quickly, he told the people, take off your jewelry, your rings, your bracelets, and your earrings. Let's make a golden calf, a god for us to worship that we can see and touch and believe in. And so they did. It was like the gods that they had in Egypt. They were familiar with that god, the golden calf. So by the time Moses came down the mountain, a party was in full swing. People were singing and drinking and dancing around an altar with a golden calf upon it. And Moses was furious. Didn't the people hear what God had said about the promise he made to them if they would obey him? So in anger, he threw down the tablets of God and they shattered into a thousand pieces. It was not a symbolic gesture. It was the sign that a covenant was ended. The deal was off. The relationship no longer existed between God and the people that God loved. I can imagine the people picking up small pieces of tablets with thoughts of what it might have been. Holding these broken rocks in their hands, some of which might have still held the handwriting of God, must have filled them with grief and guilt and shame. It wasn't Moses who shattered the covenant. That much they knew. It was their own sinful, selfish lives and the breaking of the promise they had made to God. It's been approximately, like I said, 4,000 years since the people of Israel received the Ten Commandments, and that is a long time. It's certainly long enough to remove the guilt that accompanies a broken promise. And it's long enough to relieve us from feeling responsible for others disobeying God. What were those foolish Israelites thinking? How could they so blatantly and so intentionally break God's law? But then the honest ones among us realized that we would have acted any differently than they did, perhaps. Because we break God's laws all the time, don't we? Well, don't we? The Ten Commandments were not merely intended for the people of Israel around 1000 BC or before. They're written in stone, remember? The laws of God are timeless, changeless expressions, expectations. But you and I so often choose to violate them or ignore them or, or rewrite them to fit our own circumstances. And then we assume God will look the other way. The first four commandments, as I told the children, refer to our relationship with God, including keeping the Sabbath holy, which is rarely observed by anyone these days. The rest of the commandments refer to our relationship with others. We break these so frequently that we may not even realize what we're doing. We think because times have changed and everybody's doing it, we might as well go along with the crowd. But I think we need to ask ourselves if breaking a commandment is harmful or hurtful to others or ourselves. We're told by God that God alone is to be our God, no other God. Author Rick Warren, the author of The Purpose Driven Life, which some of you may have read several years ago, suggests that everybody has a purpose in life and the starting point is God. He writes, it is only in God that we discover our origin, our identity, our meaning, our purpose, our significance, and our destiny. Every other path leads to a dead end. Unquote. And author Leif Anderson suggests that everybody has a center of life. It is that thing which is most important to us, and it controls everything about us. You can see where this is going, can't you? It should be God 
that is the origin and our identity and our center of life. And if God is at the center, then that will be obvious by the way we live. But if our God is, say, wealth or power or popularity or our spouse or our children or our hobbies or our career, then we have broken that which was written in stone. We're told not to take the Lord's name in vain, but how many of us have used the expression, oh God, or Jesus, when we're surprised or upset by something that has happened? If we're not really asking God for help or praying, then isn't that breaking the commandment not to take the Lord's name in vain? A commandment written in stone. We're told by God to honor our father and mother, and most of the time we do, but there are those times we fail. My old man says, I have to mow the lawn. I can hear teenagers saying this. They're the ones who have the most trouble, I think, honoring their mother and father. Or maybe someone says, my mom thinks I'm at the library studying, but what she doesn't know won't hurt her. Or maybe they say, my parents are the stupidest people they, I know. I hate them. My own children often said, I hate you sometimes when I enforce laws and rules upon them. But I know they didn't really hate me. But again, when we say those kind of things, we have broken what was written in stone. We're told by God that we're not supposed to lie, and we say we agree. I looked up some statistics. 66% of Americans in general think they are lied to at least some of the time. And, up from, and then that's up from 45% 30 years ago when USA Today asked the same question. 66% versus 45% in 30 years. One poll revealed that 91% of Americans lie regularly and only 31% believe honesty is the best policy. So you wonder, are, are little white lies okay? Well, that's a touchy issue. Again, I have to think about what's harmful and what's hurtful to others or to ourselves. Because if a woman asks you if her outfit makes her look fat, and you tell the truth and say yes, you might be in big trouble. <laughs> On the other hand, lying to them deprives them of some control over their future because they can no longer make an informed choice about the issue concerned. They are not fully informed about possible courses of action. They may make a decision that would not have otherwise been made. And that pertains to anybody who is lied to. Whenever we lie, whenever we fail to tell the truth, we have broken that which was written in stone. I will say that ethicists have come up with some very interesting issues about lying, so we won't get into that, it's too much, but we have, if we lie, we have broken that which is written in stone. And I think we have all lied, one time or another. We're told by God that we should not steal, and we say we will obey. But think of the pens and pencils we may take home from work, or think of the extra change we may receive from a cashier's mistake, and we decide to keep it. Many people fudge on their income tax forms and think nothing of it. And academic che cheating on exams ha has reached epidemic proportions. Academic cheating has reached epidemic proportions in our schools and campuses. The sad thing is that most students don't see the problem, and I'm sorry the children left this morning because I was <laughs> addressing some of them. <laughs> they don't see the problem. They think no blood, no foul, they say, and again, we have broken that which is written in stone. We're told by God that we shouldn't commit adultery, and we think that's a good suggestion. This sin has been committed throughout history from the beginning of time almost. Today, though, Adultery seems more rampant than ever. While tabloid stories report the, affair, the affairs of politicians, millionaires, and movie stars, 
Hollywood films feature and even promote adultery. Subtly, or maybe not so subtly. How prevalent is adultery or infidelity? In 2016, a global survey suggested that in more than one third of marriages, one or more, one or both spouses were unfaithful. And in the United States, a 2018 survey of married couples found that 25% of men and 15% of women admitted to committing adultery. Even when these lower ratios are applied to the current adult population, it means that some 19 million husbands and 12 million wives have had an affair. It is written in stone, but apparently it just doesn't matter. And I think that's also attributed to the fact that not very many people go to church anymore. The Ten Commandments forbid murder, stealing, lying, adultery, and coveting. Why? Because they are hurtful. The issue here is not that we have broken the commandments, but rather that we have become broken people. We are guilty and ashamed of the things that we have said and done. We have hurt others, hurt ourselves, and we've hurt God. Ultimately, we come to this realization and we know we need a Savior who will save us from ourselves. The season of Lent is a time to ask God to forgive our foolishness. No matter how badly we disappoint God, no matter how grave our offense, Scripture allows us to understand that our God is a God who loves us, who places love for us and compassion toward us, even though God knows we deserve punishment. Moses talked God into changing his mind. God is forever forgiving, forever merciful, even when people mishear divine commands. The love of God compels the risen Christ to plead on our behalf, even as we yearn after false idols. Today, I hope all of you have a stone in your hands. Notice that they are not smooth stones. Rather, their edges are sharp and jagged, as if broken. We have a choice this morning, and every Sunday during the season of Lent, as to what to do with these stones. We can hang on to them as a painful reminder of our sin, and it will continue to make us bitter, broken people. Or we can let them go. We can lay them at the foot of the cross and ask God to give us another chance. As Steve plays quietly, I invite you to come forward to leave your broken stone with Jesus Christ at the foot of the cross.
because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, let us join together in a prayer of confession. Lord, so often we would be great in the faith, but somehow we have failed to see the importance of being faithful in the little things. And like children, we cry out for more responsibility, but so often we fail to be responsible with what you have already entrusted to us. Forgive us, Lord, and grant us the courage to hold true to your commandments. In Christ we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. We come to that time in our service now when we lift up our joys and concerns to bring to God in prayer. Karen? of that service right now. When it's over, they, you know, they, they need to somehow put it behind them and move on. Right. So I think they need a lot of prayer. Are there any joys, any birthdays or celebrations? prayer will be kind of like a, a, a bidding prayer. When I say let us pray to the Lord, please respond with Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy is your response. Merciful God, as we seek in this Lenten time to grow in our faith, we pray for the life of the world. We pray that all fertile hand, lands might be tended with care, that crops be successfully planted and that the coming growing season might yield abundant harvests and all the bounty needed to feed this hungry world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the church be strengthened in its 40-day Lenten journey of stones, be, be delivered from all temptation and harm, and be found faithful on the day of Christ's coming. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord that those people who lack a home and wander in our modern wilderness might be helped to find a permanent place of welcome. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord that those who are ill or in any need, especially the Berwick Fire Department, Blue Batch Elder, Barry, Mr. Placid, Deb, and those whom we name in our hearts, that they may find comfort and deliverance in the generosity of the Lord of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord that the witness of the faithful departed, departed 
especially Captain Joel Barnes, who will be laid to rest today, that their witness and his witness may strengthen us in our journey, and that we be joined with them by the power of our baptism into Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have Grant these prayers, merciful God, and all that we need, as we eagerly await the Easter feast through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We will now receive our morning offering. Will the ushers please come forward? Since this is the Sunday the Methodist Church officially recognizes as Girl Scout Organization Sunday, we'd like to invite all the Girl Scouts, young and old, to stand so that we may recognize you. <laughs> well, isn't this nice? <laughs> and please remain standing. A member of our choir reminded us last week that once a Girl Scout, always a Girl Scout. So this morning, in special recognition of this special particular organization, we invite everyone to turn in their little green pew book to page 3073, We Walk His Way, which incidentally is a special tenet or principle of the Girl Scouts. And with this fact in mind, if all of BUMC's Girl Scouts actually walk the talk, We'll all sing, we walk his way. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you.